will understand this, but Jerome, who becomes an object of fascination the more you really study him, is also one of the more maligned little masters, they used to call them, of the, the 19th century academic tradition. And this is in light of, of course, our total overinvestment in, in the modernism of Cezanne. So as soon as you fall in love with Cezanne and Picasso, everybody else sort of shrivels up and dies. Um, so part of Gilru's efforts, along with a, a couple of other really important scholars of the last two decades, has been to revive interest in artists who've long been neglected because of a certain modernist trajectory that had taken over our imagination. And you know, she's participating in a really important re-excavation of a lot of artists who really deserve the, this degree of attention. Because as you'll see in the, the second part of her lecture, um, the art itself stands up to a huge amount of scrutiny because it's intensely intelligent and put together by a master in terms of the literacy in his own tradition, uh, much of which is lost on people who are not erudite enough to recognize all the clues. And that's why you have Goru. Um, so and the other thing that I just wanted to mention, as Guru and I have for the last several days been uh, exploring our vaults, as we call them, as in some gothic horror tale. I, I don't know why, as a museum, we call our art storage vaults. <laughs> but it's because we live in the original post office, and they are actually vaults. Um, in the new building, the vaults will turn into art storage above ground, which will be much healthier for everyone involved. But uh, it is a fascinating thing to go through and rediscover our permanent collection. And she will be guest curator a show on our sculpture collection, which will open in February of next year. So Gulbra will return to us and be the talking head for that show, and I'm sure she'll grace us with another lecture, uh, particularly on that material. And it will include a few non-Western things as well that no one has seen in probably ever since they've come into the collection. So it's it's really a, a delight to for me personally to work with Gulbra because I learned so much from her, her eyes and from her incredible mind, but we'll have the pleasure of seeing the show with her and through her and uh, I'm just really grateful that she's able to make the time for us that she's very busy at Amherst as well so you know without further ado and I, I do hope that our numbers grow again I don't really know what happened to our subscription this year if you know of other people who you think would be interested in this lecture series I, I fear sometimes that the natural disasters threw everyone into a tizzy and and no one is sort of doing things normally yet but hopefully we'll all get back to a normal schedule because our uh, our next speaker is also excellent, um, and he returns to us um, from Stanford, uh, where he has earned his PhD, and he's going to be talking about his topic, which is Kepish, uh, who is from the Bauhaus and a student of Maholinaj. So he'll be doing two lectures, and then uh, we'll conclude the series with Charlie Stuckey. And if you've never heard Charlie Stuckey speak, you'll be delighted by him. He's a world-renowned um, expert in the field of contemporary art and uh, a very uh, widely reputed um, art consultant for, for many important collectors. But he also has worked at every major institution in the United States. And you know, I, I often tease him because I think he exhausted the museum field. And they could no longer tolerate his brilliance, so he's now working independently. Um, but he really has worked at the Art Institute, the National Gallery, the Frick. He's worked at every single major institution. So he's vastly knowledgeable. And he's going to be talking about accumulation in um, contemporary art which is a, a very provocative concept. Um, so anyway, to get back to Jérôme, uh, so Goro is going to give part two. Hopefully you saw part one. Uh, part one is now posted online. Uh, hopefully you can all navigate our website. We keep on changing the location, but I think we finally figured out logically where it should go. So under the Learn tab, you will find Adult uh, education series and this is where Art Matters is located and there's a video library so we even have a new camera and so you can actually see the person talking in the video now which is a vast improvement so <laughs> I, I hope you'll avail yourself of that resource so okay let's have well, uh, our welcome to Guru for part two Uh, good morning again. Welcome or welcome back. Uh, the past week has been uh, very inspiring and very exciting for me. Uh, it was lovely meeting you, sharing this material with you, and of course it's always lovely for me to recharge my Ike batteries, which I now do once a year. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I look forward to seeing you again. 
Um, so those of you who were not here last week, don't worry about it. I'll make sure to catch you up on some of the things that I might be referencing from my earlier talk. So I prepared this talk with you in mind as well, so no worries. Um, is there a way to turn on the slide? Yeah, okay. As I began, began to discuss in the first part of this lecture series last Thursday, a crisis in historical representation took place in French visual culture in the middle of the 19th century. By the middle of the 1850s, many artists and critics alike came to a troubling realization. Le grand peinture d'histoire, the history painting tradition, which was the conventional yardstick of artistic achievement since the foundation of the Académie Royale de Peinture et de Sculpture in France in the 17th century, had fallen into decline and all but perished. Depictions of classical and mythological heroes that had once had exceptional influence over their weavers had long exhausted their power. Wrought iterations of ideal beauty and virtuous behavior left the public cold and unresponsive. The crisis of history painting reached a climax at the Paris Universal Exhibition of 1855. What will art in France be like in the second half of the 19th century? One art critic wondered at the time, and he added, this is the new question which is not without some importance and which is not easy to answer. Our contemporary art will have to find its formula. Now, both the crisis of French history painting in the 1850s and Jérôme's response to it were elements of a more fundamental transformation in the definition of history that had begun in the 18th century in conjunction with the rise of modern science. It was no longer God's universal order that was at the origin of the world, but long begun and ongoing historical processes hidden from sight. Evolution underlay current biological forms. Inner anatomical structures shaped visible surfaces of bodies. Historical formation of languages determined everyday speech and thought. A new idea of human subjectivity and limitations of human knowledge resulted from this epistemological turn, as Michel Foucault has demonstrated in his The Order of the Things. The individual was fundamentally inadequate in perceiving these invisible historical systems, if not assisted by empirical methods of science that investigated them. An increasing demand for observation in art, coupled with this emergent modern epistemology that posited the past as foundational and yet inaccessible to the physically and historically specific individual, led to a widespread sense of the failure of established conventions of historical representation and a growing urgency to transform the art of painting. How could a painter legitimately depict history? or convincingly represent anything at all, now that everything was understood as a product of obscure historical processes that traversed epochs exceeding the lifespan of a single individual. Since neither the painter nor the viewer could have actually experienced a bygone historical incident as it unfolded, was history painting even feasible in modern times? The group of paintings by Jean-Léon Jérôme that play a central role in my book, Jean-Léon Jérôme and the Crisis of History Painting in the 1850s, were created at this moment in French art, when what the new ambitious painting might look like, what it could represent, and how it could move the modern viewer had yet to be discovered. In a handful of paintings made toward the end of the 1850s, Jérôme aspired to make history truly experiential by mobilizing the viewer's imagination, bridging the abyss between the lost past and the living present, charting a new roadmap for painting in response to, to this modern sensibility of history. Jérôme invented compositional devices that acknowledged the viewer not as an abstraction, but as a historically situated and physically embodied subject. In the 1850s, Jérôme's painted canvases often constituted a litmus test for many of his critics. They were borderline cases where brush marks applied on the surface of a canvas no longer constituted a painting. The critics had long concurred, at least since the Anacreon, Bacchus and Eros at the Salon of 1848, that Jérôme's paintings had hardly any body, that his brush was too dry, his figures too flat. 
Paul de Saint-Victor, to pick but one discontented reviewer among many, protested in 1859 as follows. Quote, Monsieur Jérôme devotes himself decidedly to literary painting. His brush turns into a pan, he lists in detail and in an exact manner interesting subjects and ingenious ideas. His drawing condenses itself and takes the conciseness of an elegant summary. His color covers a canvas hardly more than ink eats into paper. This is calligraphy at its highest expression." End of quote. The immediate cause of the, the Saint-Victor's dismay was the three canvases Jérôme was at the moment showing at the Salon exhibition of 1859 in Paris. Ave César, Morituri te King Quincondol, and Caesar. According to the critic, while Jérôme's pen-like brush steadily listed all the detailed facts of history in a dull manner, his facture failed to animate the scene and consequently the imagination of the viewer. In arguing that Jérôme's color covered the canvas in a manner analogous to ink eating into paper, the Saint-Victor drew attention to what he perceived to be the literalness of Jérôme's unimpassioned inventory of the past, which made Jérôme's work a non-art, jettisoning it out of the realm of serious painting. In what follows, I would like to make a case for the ambitious stakes of the artist's project, as I advocate a closer look, one that corresponds to his notoriously close attention to detail. To this end, I will discuss two related paintings as I focus on a foundational moment in Jérôme's artistic project in the second half of the 1850s, a moment marred by hesitation and experimentation as he reflected on the aims and limitations of historical representation in modernity. In the Salon of 1859, he exhibited Dead Caesar. Owned by the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, D.C., the painting was deaccessioned in 1951 and has been lost ever since. The only extant black and white photograph shows Julius Caesar's abandoned corpse at the Curia Pompeii on the Ides of March in 44 B.C. The body is presented somewhat off-center in the left, lying on the floor against a classical architectural backdrop. Severely foreshortened, Caesar stretches diagonally, his head in the immediate foreground and his feet leading the eye into a hallway flanked by a row of columns in the upper right corner. In pursuit of this diagonal thrust, our eyes scan the scene and arrive at the receding perspective of the colonnaded hallway in the upper right, only to be led to a vanishing point that depicts nothing save for empty space. So I'm talking about this sharp perspectival pool, right? The elaborately ornamented mosaic floor centers on a medusa head. Here she is. Eyes and mouth wide open, perhaps in an expression of surprise or dismay at what has just taken place, she looks away from the dead figure, towards her left, into the empty corridor. A scroll on the floor, not too far from the body would have been recognized by those familiar with Plutarch's account of the incident as the letter that would have saved Caesar's life had he but read it before entering the Senate that day. Smoke billowing from a tripod provides the only motion in this otherwise very still scene. One can only imagine the effect this long lost painting might have produced on the salon visitor. According to Théophile Gautier, when seen at a distance, even before one had a chance to comprehend its subject matter, Caesar captured the viewer by its sinister, mysterious, and solitary appearance. Um, as we were talking about what the painting would have looked like, I just want to bring your attention to its dimension. So it would have been two meters by three meters. So, you know, this is approximately the size. Maybe it would have been just a little smaller than that. So keep that in mind and imagine yourself standing in front of this painting. So according to Gautier, when seen at a distance, even before one had a chance to comprehend its subject matter, Caesar captured the viewer by its sinister, mysterious, and solitary appearance. Alexandre Dumas declared the composition grand, captivating, solemn. Maxime Ducamp commented on the sensation of silence emanating from the scene. Even Charles Baudelaire, who had always been critical of Jérôme's work, 
This time, approved of the artist's, artist's unorthodox depiction of the abandoned Caesar. Here was a painting that engaged with the imagination of its beholder, a painting that prompted one to imagine the past and the future beyond what was depicted on the canvas. And this is Baudelaire, quote, certainly this time the imagination of Monsieur Jérôme was uplifted. The effect is truly great. This terrible summary suffices. We all know enough Roman history to comprehend all that has been implied, the disorder that preceded, and the tumult that followed. We can divine Rome behind the wall. We hear the cries of the people, stupid and delivered, ungrateful towards both the victim and the assassins at the same time. Let's make Brutus Caesar." End of quote. Now, Baudelaire's words summarize the action of the beholder, imagining the disorder that has already happened and foreseeing the tumult that is yet to take place. In order to stimulate the viewer's imagination, the painting sets in place a viewing structure that directs the attention from one detail to another, gleaning physical traces of the assassination strewn over the crime scene. The top of the throne, the pool of blood around Caesar's head on the floor, the blood-stained pedestal of Pompey's statue in the very left, <coughs> All such details indicate an episode of violence that immediately preceded the viewer's arrival at the scene. Not everybody, however, was equally enchanted with Jerome's rendering of this fragment of Roman history. In the eyes of many, Caesar had failed to be expressive. The fallen dictator, whose abandoned body has been left to decompose in the empty space of the Curia Pompey, was unsuccessful in moving the beholder. Many critics complained that the spectacle of death, where clues about the unfolding of events were strewn throughout, failed to add up to a self-contained narrative that could be grasped without reading the painting's title in the exhibition catalog. They argued that Jérôme had replaced the appropriate representation of lofty emotions with small details of archaeological curiosity that left the viewer unaffected. In one of the harshest reviews, Jules Antoine Castagnari referred to the artist as a clumsy inventor and a petty composer. A real painter would have used this opportunity to engage the emotions of the viewer by interpreting history as a tragedy. And this is Castagnari. Crossing in one leap the 20 centuries which separate us from this sensational revenge, a genuine painter would have brought the assassins and the victim with their fierce procession of passions and hatreds back from death. He would have grouped the assassins in a terrifying and menacing circle around the culprit ready to stab. They flash in the eyes, indignation on the lips, punishment in their gestures. He, pale, staggered, seeing himself surrounded and feeling lost, stuttering his impossible and useless defense." End of quote. Now, as a matter of fact, the scene described by Castagnari had already been painted by Vincenzo Comicini half a century earlier. Representing the instant of attack, Comicini's Morte di Cesare incorporates two dramatic moments described by Castagnari, namely the public event of assassination and the personal confrontation between Caesar and Brutus. The painting solicits its viewer to mirror or respond to the emotions of these figures in turn by experiencing fear, pity, or anger, emotions conventionally associated with the cathartic experience of watching a tragedy on stage. Now, operating according to a very different conception of a climax, Jérôme Caesar didn't elicit from its viewers the set of emotions analogous to those operative in the Camuccini. So much is clear from the unenthusiastic comments of disillusioned critics. But what kind of a viewing experience did Caesar offer, if not the passion, the movement, and the grandeur of a tragic image? Now, there's something truly peculiar about the construction of space in this painting. Despite its large dimensions, the depicted space is uninhabitable. There is a disjuncture between the monumentality of the space and the very limited view of that same space because of the way in which it is enclosed within the frame. Everything is cut in half. The columns, the statues, the walls. This is an utterly anomalous room with a general sensation of an oppressive horizontality. 
The viewer is positioned to see the corpse from an elevated vantage point, and yet the space itself is too constricted to imagine standing upright in it, unless one would bend one's head and remain as low as possible as if entering a cave, which is perhaps what Maxim Dukan experienced when he compared the painting space to a great funerary vault. Caesar himself would have been too tall to stand upright in this space. His upper torso would have been chopped in half by the fr uh, frame if he were to stand up, just as the two statues Pompeii and Roma have been. So this is Roma, here's Pompeii's pedestal, here's Pompeii, and they have all been chopped by the top of the canvas, right? Many reviewers, in fact, experienced that there was something deeply disturbing about standing in front of this painting. The critic Paul Mantz, for one, noted an all-pervasive all sense of dismemberment. Quote, by not showing more than a part of things, by clumsily cropping the columns to show but the basis, Monsieur Jérôme dismembered his composition. He did not make a tableau, but only a half or even a quarter of a tableau. It is undoubtedly for this reason that in front of a Caesar, the spectator experiences a feeling of unease he does not know how to explain." End of quote. Now, what is noted by Muntz is a proliferation of the effect of dismemberment in the overall composition. One, finding its expression in the partial views of the columns in the background, the omitted torsos of the statues of Pompeii and of Roma, and the hardly visible body of Caesar buried under layers of dra drapery and partially covered by opaque shadow. What makes Muntz's account all the more symptomatic is the highly charged set of terms he resorts to in his attempt to explain that sense of unease, crop, dismember, half, quarter. A terminology of mutilation, of decapitation even, when the critics objected to the space that contained Caesar, they, in effect, reacted to the problematic position they were put in as weavers in front of this painting. The painting simultaneously pulled one in and yet made it impossible to fantasize inhabiting its space in one piece. Despite such powerful physical responses the painting seems to have generated in its weavers, it is curious that many critics didn't perceive in its inexplicable aspects anything other than a miscalculation on the part of the painter. It had been known that before he began this salon painting, the artist had worked on a related composition, which is today identified as the death of Caesar now at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore. When Gautier saw the salon painting in 1859, he reported that it had derived from this earlier work, which he had seen in an incomplete state during a visit to the artist's studio in May 1858, so a year earlier. For many who were made uncomfortable by the salon painting, here was an explanation. Surely the general sense of truncation was due to the fact that the salon painting was, in fact, nothing but a, but a fragment of a much more comprehensive scene. In a curious account that mixed facts with hearsay, the critic Mathilde Stevens offered an explanation for the heavy shadows in the Salon Caesar. According to Stevens, after completing the Walters painting, Jerome had had it photographed. The resulting lighting effect, which illuminated the body of Caesar while leaving the group of assassins in shadow, took the artist himself by surprise. Stevens argued that it was this unexpected result that motivated Jérôme to produce the Salon painting, and that its dark shadows were a consequence of the artist's emulation of photography. This peculiar account is self-contradictory. Stevens does not explain why or how the brightly illuminated body in the alleged photographic image would come to be cast in heavy shadows in the resulting Salon painting. Nonetheless, this is an invaluable story, for it demonstrates that in artistic circles there had been word of a photograph of the Walters painting that motivated the Salon Caesar. <coughs> there is in fact an unknown studio photograph in one of the albums donated by Jérôme's wife to the Bibliothèque Nationale after his death in 1904. The partially erased list on the red cover of the tome contains a barely legible César mort. Dead Caesar. The photograph in the album does not, however, match the one described by St Stevens. 
So now I'll zoom into this photo at the bottom. Instead of a black and white reproduction of the scene of assassination featuring all the actors of the Walter's death of Caesar, Caesar, here the majority of the frame is occupied by Caesar's body. If this photograph bears a family resemblance to any of the two paintings, it is to the Salon Caesar, a heavily draped and severely foreshortened Caesar, blood-stained pedestal of Pompey's statue, an overturned throne, a tripod, the patterned floor are all present. An attentive look, however, reveals that it is not a reproduction of the Los Salon painting, for there is no receding perspective that draws the attention away from the body. What the photograph captures is, in fact, a detail of the Walters Museum's death of Caesar. The upper right corner shows here. The feet and legs of two of the assassins instead of the salon paintings colonnaded hallway. The lack of blood-stained footprints on the mosaic floor attests to the fact that the photograph had been taken before the death of Caesar was completed. So what this photograph is capturing for us is the painter pondering as he looks very intently at a detail of a painting in progress. The differences between the photograph and the Salon painting attest to the fact that the artist made some very deliberate choices when he created the painting's peculiar composition and lighting. He removed the assassins and inserted the receding perspective. Despite the extended space, the painting preserves the truncated ambience captured by the photograph. He moved Caesar from the center toward the left, thus retaining the body's prominent position in the foreground. He changed neither the drawing of the body nor the distribution of light and shadow over it. The folds of the drapery in the photograph are identical to the ones in the Salon Caesar. Most significantly, he retained the inexplicable dark shadows enveloping Caesar's face that were so puzzling to the Salon critics. Now, if this photograph proves to us that there was nothing accidental in the Salon Caesar, it hardly explains the idea behind it. What was it that motivated the painter to offer this amorphous figure whose face was in shadow and feet in light, located in an anomalous space that would pull the viewer in? To explore this question, we will need to shift our attention momentarily to the Walters painting, which had been clearly started earlier and which contains the kernels of the Salon work. The much more complex and multi-layered Death of Caesar presents the corpse spread diagonally in the lower left corner. Senators fling the scene of murder in the center and, in the right middle ground, a lone senator seated in the empty hall. This last figure has been considered the quintessential anecdote figure by generations of critics and art historians who have looked at Jérôme's work through the eyes of habit. This figure, immobile and static in his heaviness, was assumed to be deeply asleep and therefore to introduce a note of humorous anecdotality to what should have been a tragic scene. And yet he is not sleeping. A careful examination discloses that he is very much awake. His left fist is clenched and his wide open eyes look straight ahead. Angry and alone in his reaction, the senator looks at the podium toward where the crime happened. It is correct that his body is in a state of stasis, but this is an intense concentration close to a hypnotic state rather than the abandon of sleep. His heaviness is not merely anecdotal. It is there to accentuate his state of motionlessness, his solidity. In brief, he is petrified. Now, <clears throat> if we trace his gaze across the canvas, following the direction of his eyes and the tilt of his head, we arrive at the heart and cause of his petrification, the Medusa emblema embedded in the mosaic floor. The Medusa is stained by the meandering trail of bloodied footprints, as if it is her very own blood that seeps from the freshly murdered Caesar. Her mouth open and her brow furrowed, her scream is forever locked in a single instant. In the words of Louis Maran, this is an embryonic time, an infinitesimal moment during which she has just looked at herself and is no longer doing so. 
In Jerome's canvas, the Medusa stands in for the historical incident of Caesar's murder in 44 BC that the senator witnessed, that which led to his current state of petrification as a consequence of an excess of emotions. The scene that we as we modern viewers cannot see, um, for which the Medusa stands in, would have been a scene very close to what Castagnari and many other critics would rather have had Jerome depict. A scene of tragedy, inducing fear, pity, rage in its viewer. A scene close to Comicini's Morte di Cesare, displaying a variety of responses to a charged moment, such as the pathos of Caesar's tu quoque, the brutality of the assassins, and the various reactions of bystanders. <clears throat> now, in this axis of looking that takes place between the lone senator and the Medusa emblem on the floor, that of Caesar comments on conventional history painting and conventional viewing experience. Historical personages frozen in the midst of their actions in expressive mimics and gestures were no longer successful in engaging the imagination of modern viewers because they were not truthful. The past, long bygone, could not be reenacted but merely signaled in the physical residue it left behind. That is why the Medusa is only an archaeological layer in the ground, buried under the traces of succeeding events, overridden by the clues of the assassination, the blood-stained footprints, overturned throne, and the scroll disclosing the conspiracy. By painting the Medusa only as an archaeological layer in the ground, the painting signals that the historical event does not take place at the present time and will therefore always escape representation. Jérôme was intent on devising a new type of history painting, a specifically modern one, one which have to acknowledge that the past, as it really happened, was irretrievable to us and therefore impossible to represent. As I shall show in what follows, the artist came up with a simple and elegant resolution the reenactment of past events would not take place on the canvas, but in the viewer's imagination as she undertook an active and extended engagement with the painting. If we return to the Walter Caesar once more, we can begin to appreciate the extent to which Jerome aspired to induce the viewer to bring that lost historical moment into the real time of the act of viewing and imagining. The very same Medusa emblema, the one which allegorizes the petrifying fascination of looking, also stimulates the viewer to imagine entering the depicted scene. The direction of Medusa's head, facing right toward rows of empty seats, actively lures the viewer into looking at the painting in a very specific way. The semicircular rotation of the seats of the curia provides a space for the beholder who wants to look at the Medusa head on. In the lower right, the first row of seas under heavy shadow occupies the foreground, extending all the way to the edge of the canvas cut by the frame. This area is made immediately accessible by virtue of a certain sharp tilt Jerome gave the motifs and objects, as if the peacefully curving seats unexpectedly arrived at the edge of an abyss and then fell off, out of the picture plane and into the space of the viewer. The sense of continuity has a purpose to stimulate the viewer to imagine occupying one of the seats somewhere near the lone senator and then look at the podium. We can approximate the senator's position if we take in the painting from the very right of the canvas, imagining looking at Medusa frontally just as she invites us to do. Once we do that, the Medusa head emerges as a full moon, while Caesar is marginalized to the left, the only discernible part of his body remaining his feet. The rest of his shriveled corpse lingers on the periphery of our vision, an effect of anamorphic foreshortening. Now, if we follow an imaginary semicircle, as I believe the row of chairs suddenly cut by the frame urge us to do, and walk from the right of the painting to its left, as if walking in that invisible section of the auditorium, the full circle of the Medusa gradually narrows into an oval, and the body of Caesar conversely gains more substance. Eventually, by the time we reach Caesar's body and view the painting, view the composition from the lower left corner, as the foreshortened figure invites us to do, we come to see the corpse in its fullness. Looked at from this viewpoint, 
the diagonal, the diagonal directionality of the foreshortened body, joining forces with the corresponding lines of the mosaic pavement, points like the needle of a compass toward the arcaded doorway through which the crowd is fleeing. <coughs> This powerful diagonal swing from the corpse of the Caesar toward the arcaded exit of the Curia Pompeii closely resembles the Salon painting. As Jérôme pondered on how to transfer the Walters composition's complex structure to a larger canvas for the Salon, I believe he eventually decided to isolate this particular and highly charged axis of looking as the focus of the new painting. By looking from the dead Caesar's viewpoint towards the perspective structure's projection into the future, the viewer would, in Baudelaire's words, imagine the disorder that has already happened and picture the chaos that is to take place. In other words, she would reach a vivid mental image of the incident as it unfolded in time. She would be moved by this mental image and all the while remaining aware of her historical remove from the past. This axis not only offers an extended and attentive viewing experience, but also a dynamic and emotionally charged one, as the viewer is solicited to move her own body and ideally experience an element of thrill at different passages where a somatic experience is simulated, and at times, the body's integrity is threatened. The responses Caesar received at the Salon of 1859 demonstrate how forcefully the painting's partial monumentality strongly implicated the viewer's body, activating a fundamental need to hold on to the fantasy of bodily integrity, to resort to self-defense. If the Caesar paintings are Jérôme's answer to the question how to make history experiential for the modern viewer, then the disturbance of the Salon Caesar the disturbance the Salon Caesar caused its weavers takes on yet another dimension. This is the history of a traumatic past. What is represented in this painting is nominally a Republican coup d'etat, of a sort that had rough parallels in modern French history, going back to the revolution of 1789, and more recently, to that of 1848. In the Walter's death of Caesar, the symbolic figure of Roma is depicted in the guise of the traditional figure of liberty wearing a Phrygian cap, an ideal of order, a symbol that had become heavily charged with revolutionary extremism in the 1850s. One may at first think that in Death of Caesar, Jerome might have extended an implicit critique of the aspirations of the radical republicans of the 1848 revolution. But I believe he had a broader historical perspective in mind. Here, the statue of Roma, to whom Brutus directs a last look before taking to the streets to declare the death of tyranny and the birth of liberty, represents order, reason, beauty, in other words, values associated with formal containment. Here, the painting seems to conjure the words uttered following Caesar's death in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Liberty, freedom, tyranny is dead. Roma's opposite is the disheveled head of Medusa stained with blood adorning the mosaic floor, a hemorrhaging figure that, is cl that clearly failed in its initial epitropaic purpose as evidenced by the slain dictator. If the statue is the wished for ideal, on the floor are the traces of its actualization. Roma and Medusa are then two aspects of a Republican revolution. The difference between an ideal of democracy and its reality, perhaps its impossibility, its inevitable collapse into violence and bloodshed. In the Salon Caesar, where only Roma's pedestal is given to view, while the rest of her body is omitted, it is the Medusa figure that assumes a calm and contained aspect. Although an expression of consternation can be traced in her frown, she amalgamates the orderly Rome and the slain Medusa of the death of Caesar. As the beautiful Gorgoneon type, there still lingers in her the threat posed by the apotropaic function, a threat underscored not only by a proliferation of motifs of dismemberment and petrification in the overall composition, but also in her own decapitation by the edge of the canvas. Now, considering this painting's connection to the studio photograph in the album at the Bibliothèque Nationale, this abrupt interruption of the neck by the edge of the canvas is truly intriguing. 
if perhaps an unintentional outcome of the positioning of the camera in the photograph, Medusa's re-emergence in the Salon Caesar as a figure dismembered by the edge of the canvas is not accidental. There is even a slight modification. While the camera left off most of the Gorgon's face in the photograph, in Caesar, Jerome inserted the head right back into the picture. Even if Medusa's presence signals the historical event of assassination inaccessible to the modern viewer, this mutilation of its, of its neck in the Salon painting connects the past incident, which cannot be witnessed, to a present threat. Moreover, it is not only the Medusa who is under a threat, but also the viewer of the painting. If one were to incline one's head in an attempt to counter Medusa's gate, gaze and to look at this figure head on, one would find one's own neck aligned with the frame. So I'm talking about standing in front of the painting and doing something like this, right? So your neck would be aligned by, with the edge of the frame as well. This aspect of the painting, combined with the overall structure of the painting's dismembered monumentality and the po powerful perspective structure, trigger a somatic experience in the viewer. By acknowledging the presence of the viewer not as an abstraction, but as a historically situated and physically embodied subject, the painting strives to make history truly experiential, compelling the viewer herself to become, become an actor, a participant, enacting on her own body some of the danger that befell Caesar. This continued presence of a threat not only to the victim depicted in the painting, but also to the viewer's fantasized corporeal wholeness operates according to a certain logic of the interchangeability of revolutionary violence, but also an uncertainty as to the end of the era of revolutions. While the past is over, its effective power lingers on. While working on the two Caesar paintings at the end of the 1850s, Jérôme reflected deeply on what history painting was and what it was capable of doing in modern times. If the past was fundamentally removed from the present, if neither the painter nor the viewer could have access to the actual historical incident that petrified the senator, then how could one make a history painting that was truthful? The answer posed by these two canvases is that a painting could compensate for that lost historical incident by triggering an intense experience in real time. What it could do was to stimulate the imagination of the viewer through a radically active engagement with the canvas. The scene represented would no longer consist of actors arrested in the midst of their actions and responses in an effort to move the viewer. Instead, the vitality of the bygone past would only be recreated in the present in the viewer's imagination through the dynamism of the act of beholding. The viewer is therefore given the possibility to imagine entering the picture and moving inside, inhabiting that space, gleaning the physical residues of the past strewn over the surface, telescoping from the micro level to the larger scene, adjusting to different calibrations of perspective. Despite such activity, the viewer is always belated, always distant to the actual historical incident. The only mode of historical representation that is truthful then, the and the only experience of history available to the modern viewer, is the mental representation of the historical event as imagined by the viewer in front of the painting. Now, the link I extrapolate between historical truth and imagination may sound like a tenuous one. However, for French historians in the first half of the 19th century, the question of whether a vivid experience of history, one which remained faithful to historical truth, could be possible for the modern day reader had become a major one. One such historian, Prosper de Barant, criticized 17th and 18th century historians for projecting their contemporary value judgments onto events of the past. In, in contrast, he admired classical historians who had allowed, quote, the facts to unfold in front of them simply as a spectacle." Unquote. Now the spatial connotation of this term spectacle is key to Barant. The distinction of the space of the spectacle from that of the spectator guarantees that historians do not distort facts by anachronistic value judgments. Modern day readers should sit back and watch while the theater of history unfolds its spectacle. But how could contemporary readers, spectators watch historical incidents? 
uh, a second and equally important term for Berant is the imagination. Quote, while leaving the facts in their own theater, our imagination depicts things naturally, making us live in the middle of all the circumstances that surround them. End of quote. An experience of history for the modern reader, in other words, would be possible if historical facts were fed into her imagination, which would then transform them into experience. The reader's imagination, in other words, was defined as an interface that transformed historical data into something like a lived experience. As I discussed at length in last week's lecture, it was in his teacher Paul Delaroche's history paintings, especially the assassination of the Duc de Guise, that Jérôme had discovered some of the pictorial devices that activate the viewer's imagination. In Delaroche's painting, we see the aftermath of a fight that ended with the assassination of the Duke in 1588. A series of visually compelling relays leads the viewer through the scene from the timid King Henry III and his perky spaniel on the left, through frantically gesticulating figures constituting the crowded group of ambassadors and assassins, whose hands, arms, legs, and bodies set a rhythm that leads the eye to the tip of a sword pointing seemingly toward the empty center of the room. And from there, to the body of the dead duke stretched on the floor on the opposite side of the scene overturned furniture and other objects seemingly thrown haphazardly about the room suggest that there has been a fight, and yet the Duke's still unsheathed sword, as well as the freshness and meticulous grooming of all the actors in the drama show that this fight couldn't have lasted long. The external space we as viewers occupy in the De La Roche corresponds to those of Prosper de Barant's readers who are given facts and watch the spectacle of history unfold. In the De La Roche, we are present, presented with historical fa facts in the form of visual clues, and our imagination is encouraged to recreate the incident, to imagine the dead duke rise up, pick up his sword, engage in a fight, crease the carpet, topple the chair, fall on the bed, receive the final blow. This past can be experienced in the viewer's imagination through an accumulation of its physical residues. Such clues in De La Roche's paintings often dismissed by critics as superfluous historical reconstructions, merely of antiquarian interest, in fact aim to lead the viewer to a vivid mental representation of the incident as it unfolded in time. In developing this compositional device, Delaroche strove to define a novel way of experiencing history in alignment with some of the goals of contemporary historiography, and to create a historically truthful painting that could move the viewer. In fact, the condition for moving the viewer was the scene's believability, its truthfulness, as Delaroche explained in a letter in 1851. And th this is what Delaroche said. It is vital that the spectator who arrives indifferent believes from the outside what he sees he's, if he's to be moved profoundly. So you have to make the viewer believe that this is truthful. Jérôme's Let of Caesar thinks through the way in which Delaroche aimed to articulate a new kind of historical image, one which needs to be truthful to move and move to be truthful. For one thing, Jérôme's canvas refines the structural accessibility of history implied in the Duc de Guise by taking extensive pains to differentiate the position of a historical witness from that of a modern viewer. That of Caesar's theater-like space both highlights and sutures the gap separating the historical scene from the viewer's real space. This brief comparison between Jérôme's Death of Caesar and the famous painting of his teacher made two decades earlier demonstrates that an artist's role in generating viewers' access to history had become progressively more problematic by the late 1850s and that history painting had to devise increasingly intricate devices to guarantee that accessibility. A short paragraph in Jérôme's autobiography, which he wrote in 1875, gives us an understanding of the extent of the artist's unfulfilled ambitions in the Caesars project. Now, this is Jérôme writing. <clears throat> During the same period, the death of Caesar came out of my studio, which some amiable critics have called Day of the Laundress. I, who am no enemy to such joviality, recognize and appreciate the humor of such a joke. However, leaving all modesty aside, this composition merits a much more serious consideration. The presentation of the subject is dramatic and original. 
It's a small canvas that could have been executed on a much larger scale without, without losing any of its character, a claim which I cannot make for many of my works." End of quote. Now, by the death of Caesar, Jerome initially seems to refer to the Salon painting. Since the day of the Londres uh, probably alludes to a caricature of the Salon Caesar in uh, the satirical newspaper Le Charivari. Yet the large Salon painting cannot be what Jerome refers to as a small canvas. Um, it's striking that the artist conflated the two Caesar paintings. This short paragraph provides us with an understanding that these two paintings constituted part of the one and the same project to the extent that they were indistinguishable in Jerome's mind. Nonetheless, the possibility of reproducing the complex structure of the Walters painting in a much larger format, one that would have engulfed the beholder, always lingered in the artist's mind without ever being realized. Despite Jerome's defensive words in his autobiography about the originality of the idea behind Death of Caesar, the artist himself had hesitations about the feasibility of such a project. The fits and starts that marked the genesis of the two Caesar paintings, and the fact that he never transferred the Walters painting to a larger canvas, but rather synthesized its highly complex structure in the Salon Caesar suggests that even Jerome himself couldn't fully articulate his intuition about a new history painting. He had difficulties reconciling his acute awareness of the distance between the past and the present with his ambition to move the viewer by radically activating one's imagination. The fact that he had the photograph taken at a point when he interrupted his work on the Walters canvas attests to his indecision and his hesitation. <coughs> The near iconoclasm of the Salon Caesar is highly significant in its monochromy, as if Jerome tried to make as few artistic decisions as possible in presenting historical facts and give a larger role to the viewer's imagination to recreate the scene, as if artistic representation was no longer an end in itself. The canvas was but a mechanism that facilitated the production of mental imagery, dele delegating a key role to the viewer's imagination in the experience of history. The desire to make a truthful history painting by explicitly acknowledging to the impossibility to witness the bygone past had brought Jerome to such a point that Caesar almost disposed of any representation whatsoever. Clearly, such a reductivist approach to representation could not be sustained in the long run. And indeed, Jerome didn't give up on hist painting history right away. The most popular ones were yet to come. Christian Martyr's Last Prayer, Police Verso, and The Chariot Race, all focus on spectacles of ancient Rome belonging to its decline, be it the contests or the spectacularization of religious martyrdom. The insight he gained from his intensive rethinking in the second half of the 1850s of the nature, possibilities, and limitations of history painting in the modern times informed his future work in a fundamental way. The unbridgeable gap between the historical witness and the modern weaver, as well as their radically different weaving positions, would be consistently acknowledged in his later work. The distance of the modern weaver from the past would be thematized in practically all the major history paintings of his in the coming years, often signaled by the inclusion of a stage setting, an auditorium, an amphitheater, or sometimes even just a few steps. A memory of the viewer's difference from the lone senator seated in the auditorium of the Curia Pompeii in Death of Caesar, who alone has witnessed the past and who now faces the petrifying gaze of Medusa. If we want to trace in these later canvases a departure from the radical fragmentariness of the Salon Caesar, it is in their cultivation of the Walters Death of Caesar's more optimistic approach to the viewer's fantasized corporeal engagement with history. Not a reliving of past traumas, but a rejuvenated sense of the advantages of historical distance. In Christian Martyr's Last Prayer, although we are inside the arena on the same level as the huddling group of Christians soon to be martyred, and far from the distant security of the Romans watching the scene, we know that we are safe, invisible to the wild beasts entering the arena who have turned away from us and toward the Christians. Sheltered in our historical remove, we are emotionally in tune, giving a more humane reaction to the horror unfolding before our eyes than the Roman spectators. 
The sense of rejuvenation in some of these later works derives from an increasing emphasis on the mobility of the viewer's body. Multiple viewing points induce the viewer to change her physical position in front of the canvas, again in line with the multi-actual structure of the death of Caesar. Consider the chariot race, which has been defined as uncannily cinematic in concep conception by a 20th century com commentator. The setting is the same as the Christian martyr's last prayer, the Circus Maximus. The short perspective created by the wall separating the racetrack from the audience we call the Caesar paintings. And in a similar fashion, it is complicit in thrusting the viewer's body into motion. In this instance, it's neither the Medusa nor the dead Caesar that prompt the viewer to adjust her viewpoint, but the horses, who at first seem to be arrested in their motion. However, something happens with attentive and dynamic viewing. The vanishing point of the perspective structure, strongly marked by the wall separating the audience from the racetrack on the left, is off-center, somewhere toward the right, behind the obelisk. Somewhere here, right. When the canvas is viewed from its left, the horses, chariots, and their riders, all foreshortened, shrink in size and are thrown into distance. And instead, the bystanders have enlarged, right? As we adjust our position by moving from the very left of the canvas to its very right, these figures come into full focus, while fi conversely, figures in the left diminish. While this compositional dynamism clearly draws on the death of Caesar, what is new in the chariot race is the way in which the illusion of speed on the canvas is informed by, and in fact energized by, the motion of the viewer's body. The viewer's movement imbues a sense of speed on the shifting forms and growing dimensions of the running horses and their riders. As it would turn out, Jérôme's painting project eventually failed to resolve some of the central issues that had first emerged in his work during the late 1850s. It was only in the medium of polychromatic sculpture in the 1890s that Jérôme found the means to express his deepest conviction regarding the radical alterity of history, that the past is omnipresent underneath the ground that covers it. And yet, the past is fundamentally lost to us, the modern viewers, except for its residues on the surface. Now I'm showing you some details from Tanagra, a bronze edition of the same sculpture. What is profoundly modern in his Tanagra, for example, is its underlying sense of the historical past, one which is irretrievably lost, and yet whose debris is fantasized as populating the substratum of the present time. But that's the subject of another talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm open for questions, comments. What is the story of Tanagra? Tanagra, she is uh, the genius, like the uh, symbolic figure that represents the city of Tanagra. And the city of Tanagra is where these figurines terracotta figurines that Jerome is mimicking here had been discovered that showed you know, women that seemingly dressed you know, in for shopping in their everyday lives, you know, small polychrome figurines that really triggered the imagination of archaeologists and you know, history lovers in the 19th century. Um, so Jerome is referencing that city with this nude figure and you know, she's sitting uh, with an archaeologist spade on the side. She seems to be sitting on a mount. And then, when you look carefully on the mount, you see various Tanagra figurines jutting out from under the earth, right? Waiting for the archaeologist to discover the past that lies beneath. So, the lost Caesar, I mean, how is how was the painting deaccession that disappeared? Um, as far as I could trace it, uh, th that was 1951. 1951, the beginning of high modernism, the beginning of abstraction. Abstract expression is not the beginning of abstraction, but you know, 
a figurative painting, the kind that Jerome is making, and the bizarre figurative painting like Caesar, which wasn't even understood in the artist's lifetime. Uh, you know, fairly monochromatic, fairly muted color scheme. In this, as I understand, fantastical frame, because Jerome often actually designed his own frames. And, you know, the frame of the Walters painting has two columns on the side, so I can only imagine that, you know, the large frame would have been more elaborate. So what I could find out was it was sold to a Scottish collector for $15 uh, for the frame. So, you know, so either the canvas was you know, put in the dumpster and the frame was taken and somewhere in a Scottish collection, somewhere, or you know, maybe somebody saved it. But in 2010, there was a major exhibition, international exhibition on the artist, and even the curators uh, in that show, who are very well connected in Europe, couldn't trace this painting. So it was not popular in mid-20th century. <laughs> What about archivography? Do so you know that oh, yeah. we have a uh, general culture that's related to this thing? Yeah. Okay. So how would you extend what you just did in terms of his painting projects and the continuity between them uh, in terms of this project, the hmm. Hmm. and now the radical fragmentation right. of everybody? <clears throat> I never thought about the radical fragmentation. That's a great point. Thank you very much. I mean, I had thought about the fragmentation, but I had never connected it to the Caesar painting. Thank you. I will note that down. I, I, I had thought, uh, written a little about the Tanagra in the context of there was something else that I didn't really get into too much. But if you buy my book, you can read it in the chapter on Caesar. And it is the color, the application of the color on the canvas. So I have a section in, the, in my chapter in which I'm analyzing really the surface of the Walters painting. Uh, where you can really see the grains of the canvas. So Jerome applies the color very lightly on the grains of the canvas. And then I sort of extrapolate that that was more or less the case in the salon painting. Although, you know, there's no way for me to see the salon painting. But I read the critics and they seem to say that, oh, you can't see the grounds of the canvas, right? And then I relate that to the fact that Jerome is so worried to create a fictive sense of the present, the here and the now, that even his brushwork, he's trying to avoid giving a sense of an immediacy. Like, so he would be an exact opposite of an impressionist painter like Monet in that respect, right? So like, he never wants to deceive you that what you're seeing is a reconstruction, that this is not the past. This, we are not seeing this as it happens, right? So in that sense, I think about Jerome's polychromy and the application of color as solving the problem of the surface of the canvas. Because you know it's actually a very uh, problematic issue to deny that. Look, I'm going to make a mark on the canvas, and that you know somehow I will make sure that that mark doesn't indicate that I am present. I am here. I am now. I'm making this mark, right? Jerome is really trying to differentiate himself and put a distance between himself as the artist and what he is presenting to you. So it's impossible in painting to avoid you know, the surface mark to implicate the body of the artist. It's impossible. But in sculpture, it's possible. In polychromatic sculpture, uh, if you see our Tanagra head currently, it's not on view, but you know, it will come back on view when we open our sculpture exhibition. Uh, if you have a chance, please study the surface of the uh, polychromatic bust carefully. You will not see a brushwork. You will not even understand that it has been painted. It's as if it's a natural glowing color of the object itself, right? So artist is not creating a fiction for you in a way. So, sorry, these are, these are probably not clear to you because you know, these would require some longer explanation in another talk. But yes, thank you very much, yes. I mean, I thought of the fragments of the bust as certainly connecting it to symbolism, later experimentation with sculpture at the end of the 19th century, there's something very uncanny about our Tanagra bust. Again, she's so alive. She's this stunning, living, life-size human being. And yet she's broken, right? Like, you can see the edges of the marble. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, it, it, it does, it's such an interesting project, but, um, the degree to which he becomes involved in sculpture as a possible solution to his dilemma in terms of his belatedness, your belatedness as a viewer, and the impossibility of replicating it in the historical past, 
there's something very peculiar about the uh, tension between how lifelike and alive she seems when she's painted, tinted, flesh colored, with colored eyes, and the fact that her body is absent, like her, that her, she seems like she's ripped from her right. body. So what leaves in the classical past as dead, as fragments of, of loss, is very palpably something that just happened in the case of Jill and Smell. It's as though she's either right. about, it's kind of, it's kind of like in that Ridley Scott, I'm sorry, I keep on talking about Ridley Scott. <laughs> Well, he's a, he's a major interpreter of Jerome for us, you know, for late 20th century people. Yeah. Well, he has, he's featuring a, a Jerome painting of Jerome Smiles, and it's called Jerome Smiles, and it's That's a different issue. And, yeah. Does anybody else have any uh, questions for the Well, thank you so much for the Thank you. <laughs>